Well, here we are in the middle of some of the dog days of summer in Western New York. And who can't love Buffalo in the summer, especially in July? Welcome to Community. I'm Pete Gallivan. And I'm Claudine Ewing. So far this year on Community, we've had a chance to tell some really great stories. Some would make you laugh, some would make you smile, some make you cry, but they also make you think. But Pete, you had a chance to do a story recently with someone special on the Great Lawn. Yeah, Ralph C. Wilson's widow, Mary Wilson. I talked to her about the honor of having the town square here at AKG named after her husband. At the heart of the newly expanded and reimagined AKG Art Gallery is a celebration of community. From the Great Lawn to the town square, the space will be a focal point of the gallery's community engagement programming. And it's also a tribute to a man who brought a lot of Western New Yorkers together over the past 60 plus years. What does it mean to you to sit in this space bearing your husband's name? Um, it means a great deal. What it means is, is what it is what Ralph was all about. In the beginning, he brought families together to enjoy football. You know, he probably wasn't thinking about that. He was thinking about how much money am I going to lose this first year? <laughs> Rob Wilson Jr. Town Square is a 6,000 square foot gathering space enlightened by the spectacular sculptured ceiling called Common Sky. It's a series of mirrors and skylights emulating a treetop and providing for a kaleidoscope of ever changing light. As I sit in the midst of it all with Mary Wilson, the pride of her late husband's impact is palpable. But what Ralph wanted to do is make the impact now. She's talking about the work being done by the Ralph Wilson Jr. Foundation. Since 2018, the foundation has gifted the AKG more than $11 million, part of the $100 million commitment to transform the financial strength and long-term viability of art and culture in Western New York. I hope it inspires others, and, and that's what I hope. Ralph's philanthropy does also inspires others to give back instead of take. Well, the arts is just one of the focal points of the foundation, along with caregiving, economic development and entrepreneurship, and promoting active lifestyles, which is on full display with another major project in the works, the $110 million overhaul of the former LaSalle Park, which will reopen as Ralph Wilson Jr. Centennial Park in 2025. When you think about in the future, how many people are going to get joy? Because I grew up in that neighborhood and I always thought that park could be the crown jewel when you look at the water and yeah, I cry. <laughs> yeah. You know, again, as I mentioned, Ralph um, exercised every day of his life. So when it was first brought up and when we started talking about parks and trails, I just went, this is this is it. This is going to be so exciting. But the work is one thing. Everything we've done, we've thought about, what would Ralph think of this? The celebration of the man she loved so deeply is clearly another. A man who probably would have often described his relationship with the fans as it's complicated. There was always this kind of tug of war love affair between Ralph and the fans and the fans and, and Ralph. All right. Um, <laughs> Some people call him cheap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't call him cheap anymore, though. And Mary Wilson adds that, make no mistake, from the time he moved into the rock pile in 1960 to the day he died, Ralph loved Buffalo. Ralph loved the fans, and that's one reason his foundation is here, is, is that it was his home. He would have never left here. He, he would never have left Buffalo, which is a credit to the great man that he is. And she says that the fans to this day remind her of how much he meant to them. I'm still having fun with them. I was at a tailgate party last year for a game with the Bills Mafia. And then one 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 game, they gave me a jacket. So I'm an honorary uh, Bills Mafia. I, I think you you're probably the queen of Bills Mafia, to be honest with I you. I don't know. I've met the I've met some of those people that are the queens <laughs> of the Bills Mafia. As for the Bills of today, Mary believes that her husband would have joined the push to keep the stadium in Orchard Park, a move that he backed when the original talks began about where to put Rich Stadium back in 1973. So needless to say, he'd give two thumbs up to the new stadium plans? Ralph would um, be um, very joyful about it and very excited for, for Buffalo. And I think Ralph would be very happy that it's not a dome stadium. In wrapping up, I asked Mrs. Wilson 
Is there anything she wants to add? Go Bills. <laughs> of course. Back in 2017, Jolanda Hill was looking for a safe space. Being a black woman, honey, uh, in America can be very stressful. To heal mentally and physically, she eventually found it from her bike, but felt she could do more. I also wanted to give that gift to other black women. She created Color Girls Bike 2 so we'll go this way. and has been helping hundreds of women like Shayna Broughton ever since. I feel the, the heaviness of our neighborhoods and I'm able to like just kind of get away for a while by riding my bike. This is a really nice space for us to just connect and fill each other back up and heal and go back where we're going. The women do monthly bike rides, finding a little peace through activity, leaning on one another, and also making a difference in the 14208 neighborhood by soon providing more transportation options in an area without them. This summer, Colored Girls Bike 2 is opening up Holistic Cycles, a for-profit bike shop co-op in the area. It will help to fund a free mobility bank around it. That space is going to be a space where we can store more bikes, where we can store other mobility options to give our community the gift of mobility. Wheelchairs, um, scooters, um, just all forms of mobility. When the bike shop is open, Color Girls Bike 2 will then begin funding for a capital campaign to bring better bike lanes to Jefferson Avenue, a wellness center, and a travel hub. We were thinking about this idea prior to the, um, the racist terrorist attack that happened on May 14th. But after it happened, it really encouraged us more to really push this. Jolanda estimates it could cost about $1 million. Six years ago, Jolanda was able to find a safe space for herself and other women of color. Now she just wants to help an entire neighborhood feel some peace it deserves. Despite what's going on in the world, as corny as this may sound, it's good to know that I have an option, which is to like get on my bike and to kind of move anywhere that I please. Coming up, CPR Health and Gold Star Moms. That game when DeMar Hamlin suffered a sudden cardiac arrest and he was unresponsive, the quick response of the um, medical staff there that rendered um, CPR to him at that moment um, kind of really sparked call to action in the community. CPR is very important. Bystander CPR will determine whether or not a person survives or lives in a sudden cardiac arrest situation. One in four people die every year of heart attacks, and most of the time is a sudden cardiac arrest where the heart stops beating or the heart is quivering. Most incidents happen outside of the hospital, over 80%, and a person's chances of survival depends on bystander CPR. A fly pad as shown. African Americans in general have highest rates of heart disease and is even higher for black women. And we have family members, friends, co-workers that if someone should suffer a sudden cardiac arrest, it's important that we know bystander CPR. If people in the community are interested in learning CPR, they could go to our website, Buffalo AED CPR Services. We do classes every month. We offer it to families. We offer it to businesses. These three mothers have a common bond. Uh, my son, Robert, uh, Bob, he uh, went to college at Brockport and went ROTC. When he went in, it was a surprise, it was a shock. He came home one day and said, Mom, I joined the Army. Their sons chose to serve their countries. Patty Badger's son, Robert, joined the Army's 1st Armored Division. Ann Davis's son, Nathaniel Jones Jr., went into the Navy. And as you just heard, Sandy Craig's son, Travis, went into the Army. Again, I never worried. I never, never, never worried. They remembered the contact they had, and Davis discussing with her son when he should come home for leave. So he said, Ma, when should I come home? So I said, come home for Mother's Day. And Patty remembers the relief she felt when she heard Travis was being reassigned from a combat zone to Germany. That he called my husband so excited that his people said, I brought my platoon home, the whole platoon dad. He was very proud of that. 
And Sandy recalls Travis coming home on leave just in time for the October surprise storm and the Sabres games he was able to take in. And they also remember the very moment when they all became part of a club, a club that nobody wants to join. I went back to Iraq after his leave and he was killed five weeks later. Patty, Ann and Sandy are all members of the Buffalo chapter of the Gold Star Mothers. Five guys were, all five guys in the vehicle were, were killed. He was uh, on a train and he got arced by electric lines when he was on his tank. So he was burned on 70% of his body. 47 sailors was killed in a turn explosion. Gold Star Mothers is a support group for women who have lost a child in the military. We are sad, we miss them every day, but I've got some great friends who are always there for me. But it's also an organization that turns that sadness to service, the grief to activism. And that's a lot of our work is partnerships because we're such a small group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we really thank great. God. We're thank older. God we're a small <laughs> group. A small group that thrives on camaraderie and compassion, and one thought that draws them together that their profound loss was not in vain, that by serving and supporting veterans groups, they preserve their loved one's legacy. We know what our mission is once we lost that child. It was to serve. We know that. Yeah. It's to serve. She serves, she serves, I serve, we serve. That's the only thing we can do. It's called Canna House. The founder, Reggie Keefe, says they help educate and allow people to use cannabis in safe spaces, thus the club. We're actually an activity-based uh, event club. So that means we're doing puff and paints, we're doing cooking with cannabis, we do murder mysteries, uh, kickball games. It's really a full gauntlet of activity-based events. So the goal is to, you know, activate, you know, your creativity through consumption. Once again, it's all legal. We are under the guise of a private club, and so uh, the goal is to make sure we're as safe as possible to protect our members. He'll tell you the atmosphere changes based on the location, but the vibe? Oh, it stays the same. We produce and manufacture some of our um, in-house products, um, Dirty Lemonade, as well as Urban Jane's Secret Sauce. We actually do blue cheese and ranch as well. And those lemonades are in different flavors. This is lemonade with cannabis in it. This is THC infused cannabis, absolutely. Um, we've taken our time to really hone in on a safe recipe. Um, we get our product tested. You do also understand that this is not for everybody, right? Absolutely. You know, and, and our goal is to really to educate the community because we do understand that, you know, everybody doesn't consume, but you might touch somebody that consumes. And it's important that you understand that person's journey and that you don't think they're just some consumer that is abusing the plant. It's, under, you know, it's good that you understand exactly what the plant is doing for that person. Um, and just to be an educated constituent, right? You know, there are things that are going to come around. People are going to be building stuff around you. There's going to be operations happening around you. And it's just good to be informed. And I think there's a divine right mm -hmm. for us to bring this plant um, to the masses in a way that is you know, not just palatable, but, you know, equitable. Up next on Community, your crown, your hair, and a new art jewel in Buffalo. On Community, we've discussed hair, natural hair, when it comes to women of color. You've heard about the Crown Act, but there's one woman who decided to write a book. It's called Embracing My Black Natural Hair, a guide from a former television reporter who went natural. She was so Esther Miller when she was a reporter at WGRZ-TV. Now married with the son, Esther Dillard's book is eye-opening for some and uplifting for others. I always had it straightened. And I had to think about the fact that in the professional field I was in, that was not embraced. Um, having natural, using natural Afrocentric hairstyles, braids or um, things that will, that look Afrocentric, that was not acceptable on the air as a television reporter. I always wonder why other black women on the air did not wear braids. Um, and it kind of was an unspoken thing kind of pretty much that that's just not the professional way that you'd want to wear your hair. My background was always when growing up that, you know, when you wanted to get pretty for a particular 
uh, event that you always went and got your hair done straightened or um, with press and curl. There was a woman by the name of Melba Tolliver. She worked for WABC. She was one of the first who kind of was a television reporter kind of pushed back on this in wearing her natural hair. About 41% of Black women will straighten their hair um, for an interview. Uh, about 54% of Black women feel that they have to wear their hair straightened and not in their natural state in order to get a job. And that's not just for television, that's for any professional field. That's according to Dub.com's website. If there are people that are in power that don't look like me or you, um, and they feel that that this is one way or standard way that they feel is professional looking, then they set that standard. And um, I think that a lot of women are pushing back against that. We've got now uh, in Katanji Brown Jackson, the first uh, Supreme Court justice who's actually uh, got natural hair. She's wearing um, the same type of hairstyle that I have, our sister locks. And it's it's encouraging to other women that are in a professional field that no matter whether it is a political position, whether it is a, a business position, whether it's teaching, that you can be able to wear your hair in a natural state and still be professional and still be able to know how to do your job and still be able to do a good job. I hope that people will get inspired to get behind the Crown Act and support other women who are trying to just be themselves in a professional space. Oh! I got one question, but when we gonna put the tap shoes back on? <laughs> <laughs> What's up with that? I still got something now. And she definitely has more. Well, hello, it's a pleasure to meet you. Meet Nelay Mignon. She has an EP, Estasy, on all streaming sites. The thing about my music that I enjoy is that I feel like it's just me. It's very authentic. I feel like people who know me or get to know me can kind of connect the dots when they listen to my music. I feel like it's it's pop r and It's very it's very lively, it's very fresh, it's very new. It makes you want to dance and feel however you want to feel to it. The music scene in my family is very strong. Everyone either sings, dances, plays an instrument in some way, shape, or form. My dad is the lead singer of Cool in the Gang. A few years ago, when her dad, Sean McQuiller, was on Community, listen to what he told his daughter. But I'm, I'm extremely proud of what you're doing. You, your hustle is pretty amazing. And now, where do you see this going? I see it going really far. I feel like I see myself becoming one of the best performers out there. I see myself becoming just an all-around mogul, entertainer, um, businesswoman. Do you feel you have an advantage because you mentioned what your dad does, um, so he's seen it all, mm -hmm. and that's helped you. Has that helped you? I feel like it's definitely helped me, yes. I feel like it's definitely helped groom me to just know, like, just, like, proper, like, etiquette from just, like, on stage, behind the scenes, just, like, perfecting my craft to the point where it definitely plays a big part today of just, like, my confidence. I feel like Nothing can stop me, to be honest. Lackawanna bred, 25 years old, and ready for the world. They can look forward to seeing someone of such a pure, raw talent really show the city in a positive light. Respectfully, her latest song, She Wrote It. Life's not over, you just want for me, respectfully. The message behind that song for me, I feel like, was more so of just, was all around just knowing your worth. She represents music of a new generation. Who's on your playlist right now? So on my playlist right now, a lot of Summer Walker, girl. Love her, love her vulnerability for sure. I love Kehlani, um, Janae Aiko, and Snow Allegra. And I'm just excited <laughs> to see everybody when they start realizing what you about to bring. It's, it's gonna yeah, be amazing. So. Looking like a fool, uh, it's like it's now. You don't know what to do now. Just, Stay true to myself, stay true to me. Don't lose myself getting caught up in the mess with everything else and the music and people who put on these facades. Don't let the haters distract you because one thing about it, I know I'm on the right path. I know God is leading me in the right direction, so I stay true to that. Nelle Mignon plans to release new merch and music. And I wanna just continue to put out raw, authentic, good music 
um, great shows, great production, to make sure I'm giving people nothing but quality across the board. And I can't wait to hit stages in front of people that have no idea who I am that I can then soon capture as well too. So we talked in 2016 when Mr. Gunlock announced this massive donation yes. to really transform this entire campus. I guess just how, how relieved are you and excited are you that here we are? Uh, of course, it's a moment of joy, uh, and it's really a moment of joy not just for everyone who works here at the Buffalo AKG Art Museum, but for our entire community. It's a historic moment for the sixth oldest art museum in America to finally have a stadium on which its world-renowned collection can shine and radiate and serve our community. That's what this project has been all about, being a community partner and opening the museum to visitors from near and far in a welcoming, hospitable way. To make create a museum where everyone can say, I feel at home, this is my place, and not an intimidating place where you kind of feel like, well, do I really belong here, and I don't know much about contemporary art. This museum has been now designed to really move people in a way that makes them feel at home. Think of it as your living room. <laughs> it seems like space was such a constraint for you before. Yeah. How transformational is this addition? totally transformational. So if you consider the fact that previously we were able to show about 100 to maximum 150 works from the collection at any given time, and now we have 430 works from the collection on view, uh, that's, a, that's a remarkable transformation. I mean, there was a moment when I had a Monet painting on my office wall and I did not request it, and that was because it was better there than in uh, a storage facility. And now we are able to share both audience favorites like the Mirrored Room, new acquisitions. Uh, we've acquired more than 500 works uh, during the period of construction. So uh, there's just a lot of things for people to see. Old favorites, new favorites hopefully, and lots of public spaces, including a third of the campus being free of admission charges. So you can just slip in for 30 seconds, and if you want to stay longer, you can. What is your message to Western New Yorkers who maybe visited the museum a couple times in the past, but weren't regular visitors and who live right here in Western New York? Uh, how do you convince them this is a place you've got to come and see now? Consider it a place where your imagination can soar, where your children, your friends, your parents can feel the magic of a truly exceptional house of treasures, where we will work with you to find sources of inspiration, uh, where your creativity can flow. Uh, you know, I've worked uh, closely with all the construction crews that have built this museum. I know many of them by name. Um, and it's interesting how they are starting to feel the excitement of the art going on the walls. Not all members of the construction crews are necessarily museum goers, but they feel the excitement. I see the glitter in their eyes, the pride that they have put uh, into their work as they have constructed this extremely complicated new facility. The same holds true for the Knox building. You walk into it and there is Oliver Eliasson's and Sebastian Behrman's common sky that canop forms a canopy over that formerly open air sculpture courtyard that would be covered by three feet of snow in the past. Mm -hmm. Now you can come there and have a picnic any time of the year and there are no admission fees for the Knox building. So it's really easy to come there. Well, thanks for joining us for another month of community, this month's best of series. Got to do it sometime. This is July. We wanted to show you what has happened, but coming up in August, we'll have some new stories to bring you on community. We'll see you next month.